So welcome back to another edition of Lunch and Learn. Uh, I'm Chris Merritt and I'm going to talk to you a little bit different topic today. I'm going to talk to you about the railroad tie cutting industry of the Uinta Mountains. So when I first started my professional career with the Wasatch Cache National Forest here in Salt Lake City, I was exposed to some of these really interesting historic sites up in the Uinta Mountains, which is the northeast corner of Utah. So what I want to walk you through today is a little bit of an unknown history, but played a pivotal role in the development of the American West and even parts of Wyoming and Utah's industry. So my title actually starts with the wooden beds for wooden heads. This is actually a pencil inscription in the inside part of a door of a cabin up on the north slope of the Uinta Mountains. And to me, that speaks very personally about the folks that were cutting railroad ties up in the Uintas and how they reflected on their career and how wood in themselves were kind of intermixed. So I think it's kind of a good starting point. So why was a railroad tie cutting industry up there? Well, we need to go back to the story that we've heard a little bit about. The Transcontinental Railroad, as it was being constructed from Sacramento or Omaha, needed tons and tons of wood, not just for trussels and buildings, but every mile of track laid required 3,300 railroad ties. Now those were eight feet long, uh, seven inch square. And so that was a huge amount of timber needed. And those railroad ties also had to be replaced every so often. So the fuel for the railroad was as much wood as it was coal. So when we look at the history of the Transcon, we know as it entered Wyoming in 1867 that there was railroad tie cutters already up in many of the mountains in Wyoming. And when we fast forward to May 10th, 1869, that doesn't stop. That railroad as it continued to be uh, expanded, improved, or even ties replaced, those ties had to keep coming out of the mountains somehow. Now, checkerboard ownership, that's a critical facet of why the parts of southwestern Wyoming and even northwestern Utah have this sort of checkerboard ownership. As the railroad moved west, they actually were granted land from the federal government, public domain land. That public domain land was meant to spur the next mile of construction by selling that newly accessed land to homesteaders, ranchers, or whatever. But this left, in areas that there weren't really demand for that land, a lot of ownership that transferred over to the railroad companies. Now those lands up in the Uintas and some of the mountain ranges were some of the heaviest hit by logging because they didn't have to pay the federal government any royalties for cutting the land. So this phrase, lay, layer out and knock off the juggles. From 1866-67 all the way up until 1939, the majority, if not all, of the railroad ties cut in the Uinta Mountains were done by hand with a broad axe. They didn't use saws, they were seen as inferior. They didn't do sawmills, they were seen as inferior. So the true craftsmen of carving railroad ties was really the, the emphasis. Now, layer out and knock off the juggles is a tie hack phrase that came from a Missouri tie hack. Now this goes to laying her out, which is knocking down an eight foot segment of tree. Uh, and then rounding off the edges, so knocking off the juggles. So when you knock a tree down, right, you have a nice round core. So if they squared it, you're knocking off the juggles. Now, this is an interesting phrase because it was applying in Missouri, but the same process was occurring out here in Utah and parts of Wyoming. Now, this slide, products one. So the majority of what the tie hacks were going after was that left tie eight foot long, seven inches square. That's what they get paid the most for. That's what the railroad companies wanted. But you could still get some amount of money for smaller ties. Now they couldn't be used on the main line, but maybe for sidings or spur lines or freight line that went into warehouses. But these numbers come from 1913. So for every one standard or first cut tie, a tie cutter could earn 17 cents. The best tie cutters could do 22 in a day. So those are that's 11 trees, 16 feet long, bucked into two eight-foot segments and squared. That's a lot of work, especially with a broad axe. You could still make some money if you didn't get that far. So as the railroads waxed and waned over the 19th century, you could still have a lot of interest in mining. And so a lot of the secondary railroad ties were actually modified to be used in mining operations. So you see mine ties there on the left. You still make a decent amount for those, but obviously railroad ties were the most lucrative 
Props and stoves. These are the wood that would be used inside mine shafts or adits. So to kind of frame up that man, mine shaft, you could build you know square timber using some of this lumber. When I first entered this history, I thought, oh, you know, logging was occurring during the summer when it was nice and pleasant. In actuality, work was being done in winter. Winter was the preferred time because you could cut down all the trees and then you could load up the cut ties onto horse-drawn sleds and slide it right out of the forest. And so logging in the Uenos was really a September through February, March endeavor. And then as soon as the snow melt occurred, they would pile all the ties in ponds that had been retained with dams and then breach the dam. The ties would float to market on the Bear River, Black's Fork, Smith's Fork rivers. So winter was the target. That winter logging actually created an interesting legacy. As you walk across the Uinta Mountains today, you see what we call high cut stumps. So I'm about six foot two. And so this stump is almost up to my shoulders. This is about a four and three quarter foot tall stump. That does not mean an eight foot guy cut this down. It means that there was probably three to four feet of snow on the ground when this tree was cut down. And so these kind of give you a cool indication of that seasonal logging uh, kind of atmosphere. So this is a historic photo of a Thai river or a Thai flood uh, in Green River. So this was downstream of the Wind River Range. So they dumped all the ties in, they floated all the way down to Green River, Wyoming, and then fished out. So those are tens of thousands of railroad ties that had been cut over the preceding winter. And now they were being fished out right at that boom on the right. But this kind of gives you an, an impress of the scale of the industry. So when we look at Wyoming, and you've driven across I-80, you know there's not a lot of trees along the railroad line or I-80, which basically parallels each other. But all these mountain ranges throughout the Wyoming area, these were supplying the railroad ties for the Union Pacific effort. Now, our interest is in that bottom left, the Uinta Mountains, but you can see the Wind Rivers, the Laramie Range, the Medicine Bow Range, all supplied railroad ties. Uh, but we're Utahns, we're gonna focus on Utah. So the north slope of the Uinta Mountains, to give you some judgment, is up there in the upper left is Evanston, Wyoming. Um, and so the tie industry really spans the Bear River drainage, which is being drawn here on the west. So if you drive down Mirror Lake Highway to Evanston, that's the way you would go. All the way to Black's Fork, which is kind of the center part of the North Slope. Uh, on further east is the Smith's Fork uh, branch and then Henry's Fork. Henry's Fork was outside the tie cutting uh, zone, largely because you see how it makes that hard turn eastward. The ties that would have been floated actually would have been dumped into the Green River dozens of miles upstream or downstream from Green River and wouldn't have been logistically useful. So they really focused on the Bear, the Black, and the Smith's Fork drainages for most of the tie cutting from the 1800s all the way into the 1930s. So the first tie cutting period, I say, is 1867 to 1912. As tie cutters moved into the Uinta Mountains, this was to fuel the first transcontinental railroad. These early loggers were ranchers, farmers looking for seasonal income, and then sort of the non-professional Irish Civil War vets, you know, the other folks that were looking for employment as they came west. Definitely not a professional logging crew, uh, but they had a major impact. They supplied, you know, tens of millions of railroad ties to our spreading railroad industry in the west. Some of the early firms up on the North Slope was Cohen Carter. So Cohen Carter was actually the major supplier of railroad ties to the Union Pacific Railroad during the transcontinental construction, especially in southwestern Wyoming. They established several firm uh, locations throughout the North Slope, but they had an interesting business model. They were middlemen. They actually did not have employees that were cutting timber. They would just pay other private individuals to go cut the ties, and then they would pay them a piece rate. Later, when we move into phase two, they became employees, but Cohen Carter kind of stayed at that level. What's really interesting is that there's very few of these camps remaining. This camp is still located on the main fork of the Black's Fork, and this is one of the original Cohen Carter camps. As you can see, 150 years has kind of damaged the integrity of these cabins. But what's important is that they're still there. They can still tell a story of these big camps. And it's kind of remarkable that in such a harsh environment like the Uinta Mountains that we can still see such uh, vibrant remainders of the past. The second tie cutting period, uh, 1912 to the 1930s, really sees a major shift. So where Cohen Carter was decentralized, the new company that came in centralized. Uh, 
They were feeding this rapidly expanding and upgrading railroad system throughout the American West. And this really led to a more systematic way of organizing labor. So there was one major logging company that did the entire tie cutting industry from west to east on the North Slope after 1912. This is the Standard Timber Company. And also we see labor succession. So early on, there was those, those mutts, the farmers, the ranchers, the miscellaneous folks cutting ties. After the 1912 period, Cone, or, uh, Standard Timber Company really focused on Scandinavian loggers because they were more professional. They were, again, another immigrant group that could be paid slightly less than others. And we see a change. So this site map on the right is actually a uh, image of a site map that I recorded when I worked for the Forest Service. But this indicates that change. So many of those early camps were individual cabins with bunk beds. But as we expanded to larger camps with more employees, we actually had specialized buildings. So cookhouses, bunk houses, uh, foreman's houses, uh, blacksmith shops. So these camps expanded in size and orientation. And then uh, this is that same cabin uh, sort of layout. You can see still not a lot left of those, even though these date from the 19 teens and the early 20s. So Standard Timber Company uh, was the big dog on the North Slope. Formed in 1912, they established their main commissary or store on the Mill Creek, Mill Creek drainage. That's about three or four miles east of the Mirror Lake Highway. By 1913, they had almost 200 employees at work cutting railroad ties in that drainage. And they were based out of this really epically cool log cabin commissary. I wish this thing was still around. It was two stories tall, kind of a T-shape. And this is where the loggers could get all their supplies, their food, their broad axes, you know, everything that they would need to largely live. Of course, they were buying it from the company. And so the company was not only paying you, they were also taking your money back. This is a common story when you look at all the mining towns throughout the Americas. So as we started in 1913 on the Mill Creek drainage, they had a contract to supply 9 million ties in seven years. That's a major industry. When you're thinking you're getting... Two, two ties per one tree, nine million ties, this four and a half million trees had to be taken down. And they're focusing on these eight to 10 inch uh, diameter trees that when they cut them, they get that eight inch. So maximize efficiency. As 1913 started logging there, they had to systematically keep moving eastward. So in the 1916 to 1918 period, they established the Black's Fork Commissary, uh, and then Main Fork, Black Fork, Steel Creek further east by the early 1920s. So just kind of working west to east across the North Slope. We do have some really awesome photographic records. A 1913 report completed by the Forest Service was the best documentation we have of this early uh, logging industry. And they photographed and created a really detailed account of efforts on the North Slope. So this guy and his awesome mascot, a uh, black guy I could live up to, he's bucking a tie. So he's dropped a 16-foot tree. Now he's cutting it into 8-foot segments. They would then load it up onto these horse-drawn sleds. Um, they would pile up along these strip roads and then load it up in the winter. But sometimes those horses had a bad time. Snow in the Uintas can get pretty deep and get pretty bad. So you can see this guy's already spent a long time trying to dig his team out. After they got loaded, this is that same store down in Mill Creek. They piled up or banked the ties next to waterways. Downstream, there would have been a dam that retained water. And then in the spring, breached that dam. And all the little railroad ties would happily float down this little flume. Some of the other bigger ones would float down the main stems of the Bear or the Black's Fork. But this record really gives us a great indication of what early logging looked like. By 1939, things had changed. Uh, the advent of gasoline-powered chainsaws, portal sawmills, diesel trucks, and also a bunch of unhappy downstream neighbors who got tired of the irrigation canals being gummed up by ties every spring kind of ended the seasonal flow of how we did logging up in the North Slope from 1867 till 1939. Um, the photo in the upper left, that's the splash dam at Mill Creek. So this would have had wood flashing on there to retain water. And then in the spring would have been opened up during the floods. And then the bottom right is the section foreman's house at Steel Creek. But this kind of signaled the end of the tie hacking peak period in the Uinta Mountains. And then after we moved through the 1930s onward, tie cutting kind of declines, but timber was still needed, especially post-World War II expansion. So we moved to more portable sawmill operations. Uh, people were living down in Wyoming, driving up to do logging or moving camp to camp where there was a sawmill, not doing it by hand anymore. 
So this is an example of one of those portable sawmill uh, facilities and probably a bunkhouse associated, but most times there weren't. Um, this is a, a example of abandoned truck. This is a 1950s camp. Um, and then finally this. After a portable sawmill is picked up and moved, the only thing you can really tell where it was is by the slag left behind. So these are slab wood and bark piles after trees have been shaped. And so we can actually see the movement of logging companies through the mountains just by these piles of just thrown away lumber, which I think is really cool. As we move into the new decade, you know, we're still logging in the North Slope, but now it's salvaged for pine beetle kill. Um, but this legacy of the tie cutters continue. Part two of this talk, we'll talk about the demographics. And part three, we'll talk about the archaeology. So I appreciate everybody listening today, and I hope you the best. Okay, bye.